Happy Sunday, everybody, and welcome to those of you that are going to join us for Facebook Live, um, as well as those that will watch this on a YouTube channel later. I hope all of you have had an amazing weekend. Um, we are going to continue our journey through the story of David and Goliath. Now, it's a, a very short story, and I have uh, received some questions already asking how or why I decided to break down David, David and Goliath into so many parts. After all, it's one chapter in the entire book of 1 Samuel. And realistically, although it's only one chapter long, there are, it, are so many different ways that you can pick apart the story of David and Goliath. Um, so doing it in smaller sections and even focusing on 10 verses at a time can sometimes really help dig into a deeper meaning and message. And that's what I'm hoping some of you have taken away from this journey. Uh, David and Goliath is that ultimate underdog Cinderella story. It's, it, I love it because of that fact. This story is about a young man who, against all odds and in the face of adversary, tackles a very dangerous situation with faith in God like no one else has demonstrated. Um, young David, as we know, is the youngest in his family. He is the youngest son of Jesse. His oldest three brothers are part of the Israel army and are at King Saul's army camp at the beginning of the story. Young David um, is primarily a shepherd, but he is also a royal musician for King Saul. Um, when the Philistine military organization moved into their area, the Philistines took up one hillside while the army camp was on the other hillside and we have the kingdom kind of in the middle. We get this very egotistical uh, military organization because they have been so superior and have managed to take over countless countries. They decided that when it came to King Saul's um, kingdom, that they would just put forth one champion because they knew that they could defeat King Saul's army no matter what. So they sent forth Goliath, this nine foot, nine inch tall man who has experience like no other um, and used tactics of intimidation and belittlement um, to really entice fear into the entire kingdom. He refers to everyone involved in the Israel army as mere servants of Saul. Uh, no one wanted to fight this guy, not even King Saul. Uh, young David was then sent to the military camp to bring bread and cheese and other provisions to not only his three oldest brothers, but to the commanding officers as well. Jesse asked David to return to him with a report on how things are going, how, the, how his older brothers were doing. Little did Jesse realize, though, that by sending David to the camp, things were going to take a very different and unique turn. When David arrived at the camp, he heard Goliath's intimidation call, calling for someone to step up and fight him. Um, and he, David couldn't understand why everybody was so afraid. David was not intimidated by this guy. You're talking about the youngest person in this area who was hearing this scream, this bellowing of this giant, watching even his older brother shake in fear, commanding officers shake in fear, and David's like, I don't understand what y'all are talking about. This guy is literally doing nothing but saying awful things about the army of the living God, and you guys are just letting him do it. Like, why is no one stepping up to take this guy on? I don't get it. So news of David's comments and even thoughts and even um, an argument that he got into with his oldest brother got back to King Saul who sent for David. David then tells King Saul that no one should lose heart because the servant of Saul is going to fight this giant. And Saul initially tells him, no, there's no way you're going to do it. You're too small. You're too young. You have no experience. This guy is bigger than you, stronger than you, and he's been a warrior since before you were born. It's not happening. David then rebuttals King Saul's initial no statement with, I've been a shepherd. The sheep and their safety is my job. And when a lion and a bear come and take away one of my sheep, I not only chase after it and get the sheep safely away from the grip of the lion or the bear, but when they turn their teeth and claws on me, 
I grab them by the hair and I kill them. Just as God has seen me through that, he'll see me through this. So King Saul's like, you know what, go ahead. I've been waiting 40 days for someone to step up. And if you really want to give this a go, I got nobody else willing to do it. You do you. So today we're going to look at what it means to be courageous. And we're also going to take a look at this idea of what perfect armor or weaponry really looks like when in the face of adversary. Courage is the ability to do something that frightens you. Now, in the case of David and Goliath, David wasn't necessarily taking on something that scared him. He was taking on something that scared everybody else. Courage is the ability to show strength in the face of pain and grief. David did show strength in the face of pain and grief when he saw what this giant was doing to people he truly cared about and doing to the army of the living God. He was willing to do something that frightened everybody else. He was willing to face potential pain and realistically even death but through the strength God provide, he believed he was going to come out on top. How often do each one of us get faced with a difficult circumstance, but make a decision based on fear? How often are we willing to call out our adversaries and stand firm in what we believe in? Today, we're going to take a look at how David ends up preparing for battle. Um, and today's lesson comes from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 38 through 47. It reads, let me put my eyeballs on. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to it. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in a pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now, I want to back up a little bit and talk about Saul. Saul, before he let David go to battle, had had many conversations with multiple people, his commanding officers, his folks that are in his army, and he had conversations with David about this battle. Um, and the one thing that never changed was the fact that Saul was such a superficial person. He cared and noticed only things that were outward. Uh, to Saul, the only way for David to then be prepared for battle was to have what he felt was the best armor possible. Again, this is all external. Saul wanted him to have the king's armor. But at the same time, one begs the question, just because it's royal armor, does that really make it the best armor? If you're someone who leans solely on the outward appearance 
or outward knowledge, it's easy to have a very skewed view of reality. Give me just one second, folks. My battery is low. That moment you realize you should have checked your battery power before you get going. Okay. So, if we focus solely on the outward appearance, we're going to have a very skewed reality of any situation. Uh, it's the same when we talked last week about having a very narrow viewpoint. Sometimes you have to be a little more open to different things. You don't always have the right answer. So what happened then when Saul decided to dress David in the royal armor? David couldn't walk. David did not look like a warrior. Saul's armor did not physically fit David. It would be like me taking my fencing gear, throwing it on one of my kiddos at church and telling them, hey, see what you can do. The gear wasn't right. Not only did the armor not fit him physically, but there was this underlying element that the armor did not hit, fit him in a spiritual sense either. No external armor would win this battle. No human ability to have a fight plan would win this battle. Only David knew and understand that he had to rely on God's strength and God's plan for battle to see him through this. And there's this under, this is, again, we need to quickly realize that we as human beings need to stop trying to do what I like to call the copycat method. And what I mean by that the armor or the battle tactic that someone else uses to deal with a circumstance in their life may not always work for everyone else. But there is this ingrained idea amongst humanity that if we do something exactly like somebody else, we will be equally or more successful than that person in a situation. And it's an incorrect logic. Each one of us are made as individuals. And I know that I've got some friends that may be watching this that have a twin. And you may look like your twin. But you are still noticeably different from your twin. There is still something about you that is unique to you. We can use fingerprints as an example to that. There is still something about us that is unique. Not everything is going to work the same way for everyone. This idea that we can copy someone else is a thought of pride instead of faith. When we look to others for a path to take instead of looking to God, we're already setting ourselves up to not be as successful. God's work is never effectively done if it's used in a copycat method. Now, I want to plug in here a little disclaimer. As Christ followers, we are called to be as Christ-like as we can be. Now, does that mean that we copy everything Jesus did moment for moment? No. It means that we take the lessons taught to us and try to live them out in our own lives. I am called to a life of love, a life of service, a life of spiritual caregiving, a life of partnership. I am not called to, to impersonate someone else. I am called to be the me that was created to the best that I can be using the lessons that I have been given. In my 32 years on this planet, I'm very aware that I am still a very young adult. Yes, I'm in my 30s now, thank goodness for that, but I'm still a young adult. But even in my 32 years, I've seen my fair share of battles. 
I have had to make very difficult decisions or fight my way through circumstances. And the times that I did it my way versus allowing God to put the path in front of me that he wanted me to be on, I caused myself more harm than good. And I've had people sneer at that kind of remark. Oh yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You problem solving really made your life hard. Well, yeah, sometimes it did. There were times where I did what I did feel I should have been doing at that time. And there were other times where I might've had conflicting thoughts and I let myself go one route because it was the route I wanted to do. Wasn't necessarily the best route to get there. And I ended up causing myself to become bitter and angry and broken. It was the emptiest and probably some of the saddest parts of my life because even though I managed to handle something, I ended up taking two steps forward but then taking one step back. I never kept progressing forward. David decided that he wasn't comfortable in the royal armor. So instead, he decided to take Saul's armor off. The battlefield. Ask anyone in a martial art. Um, ask anyone who studies historical European martial arts. Ask anyone who studies any kind of combat sport. The battlefield, the competition arena, is not the time to you to learn how to use a new weapon you never go into something with a brand new piece of gear it's not the time and place for it by taking off saul's armor david was saying this armor is not the right armor i can't wear this i'm gonna trust in the armor that god has provided me and how often do we find ourselves tempted to walk the line of flesh Versus, versus spiritual armor. Trying to sometimes use pieces of both instead of focusing one way or the other. It doesn't work that way either. God wants us to trust him in its entirety to the fullest extent. And in order to do that, we have to be willing to give up this human nature to, to be control freaks and to dictate what God will do and when God will do it and to how we want it done. The first great decision David made was picking up the weapon that he was most comfortable with, which happened to be his staff and his sling. David was not egotistical when he chose to do this. David never once tried to hide the fact that he was primarily a shepherd. These are the battle tools that he had in his field of choice. He knew that he could function with a staff and a sling. He was not a member of the Israel army. He did not have the same training that they did. He did not have the experience in wearing the type of armor they had. This was where he had his power. The only thing he had to gather along his way were five stones from the stream. And notice how in our reading, it actually described it as smooth stones. They didn't have to be sharp. David knew that a smooth stone was just as deadly as a stone with a sharp corner at this point. Because when struck at the right position, a smooth stone's gonna do just as much damage as a stone with a sharp edge. David then approached Goliath with his sling in hand. Notice that pronoun, his sling in hand. This was not a brand new sling. This was not a sling that King Saul quickly had some blacksmith will together for him. This was the sling, again, that he used before and was comfortable with. This is an interesting point to understand. As a society, we often try to construct new things or new weapons for what we might face in a new day or a new week ahead. We put effort into forming groups of counselors or crusaders. We put money into putting groups of people together, flying in experts, hiring personnel for situations. But the kicker is the enemy will never be conquered at the hands of new and unused and untested 
weaponry, okay? It's not going to happen. David knew better than to rely on untested materials or new methods because he has worn and torn weapons and has come out victorious while bringing down the doubts of others. Goliath sees David approaching him and with his normal attempts of intimidation and ridicule begins to mock David for his age, his choice of weapons, making fun of them, calling them sticks, and even attempted to curse David by his gods. Poor Goliath doesn't even realize that these gods are powerless next to the God that David served. For those that are not firm or steadfast in their relationship with God, the tactics that Goliath used would work. Had anyone else gone up to Goliath in the same manner of David and Goliath started mocking them, they would have cowered and ran away. But David understood that we can't forget that God is the one that's actually at work and we are merely the conduit. David announces that he comes in the name of the Lord Almighty by telling Goliath that no matter the amount of armor Goliath may have, no matter the weaponry that Goliath may have, the name of the Lord is stronger than Goliath. The righteous run to it and are safe. David demonstrates that he is no mere servant of Saul as Goliath had claimed everyone to be. Instead, David is demonstrating that he is a representative of the living God. Only when we proclaim the name of God can we actually defeat that which is dark in our lives. Jesus demonstrates this exact same outlook with his disciples. David then refers to the Lord as the God of the armies of Israel. Notice how I said armies, the plural form. Seems odd. After all, there's only one army that Goliath can see the Israeli army. But what about what is unseen? What about the invisible army of angels that are at God's command? David lets Goliath know that on this day, the Lord will hand Goliath over to David. When we're in the midst of battle, it is not us that defeats the enemies. The Lord will deliver our enemies to us. Goliath tells David what he will do to him, and David responds to Goliath in a similar experience. Here's the thing. Goliath's comments are based solely on his ego and pride. He's looking at how big he is versus how tiny David is, and how experienced he is versus how unexperienced young David is. David's comments even though they're the exact same words Goliath spewed, are based in his confidence in the name of the Lord and his motivation was also very different because he was fighting not only for God, but for the army of the living God. David wants to demonstrate a very important message to his fellow Israelites that God does not save by sword and spear. He who lives by the sword will die by the sword. The Lord does not save through the sword and the spear. This lesson traces back long lineage to the days of Moses and Joshua. It's been reminded in the days of Samuel and in the early days of Saul and Jonathan. But clearly the Israelites have a very short attention span and don't remember things, even though history continues to repeat itself. Human nature, I swear it's a thing. The Israelites need to be reminded that instead of investing in weapons of war, they should be investing their hearts into a relationship with God. The battle, after all, is the Lord's. What David is saying is, this is not my battle. I'm kind of like an errand boy for God. I'm just the conduit. God may use me to throw a stone, but God is the one that owns this battle. Imagine the kind of strength and peace each one of us would know if we were to have this tattooed on our hearts. This notion that the battles we face are not our battles, but they are God's battles. And if we were to let God do what God wants us to do, maybe we'd quit making our lives so hard. 
David started out by making a speech that sounded like he was speaking for himself, but ended up turning the speech around and speaking for a victory that would be for the entire people of Israel. We need to understand that whatever God does through us as individuals is not for our own personal gain or glory. If God is doing something through you, it is something that will benefit the entire body of Christ. This portion of the story of David and Goliath is nothing more than one giant ego check. David never spoke in a way that was holier than thou. He spoke truth and confidence of the Lord God whom he knew would be victorious. We cause our own anxiety, turmoil, stress, anger when we forget to let God handle it. I will admit that I am a control freak. I not only see a situation about to happen, I'm already planning A. If path A doesn't work, I got B, C, D, E, and F. I've got so many different backup plans. That's how I operate. But I have had to learn some very humbling notions when it comes to how I decide to do things. Just because I can figure something out my own and fight through something on my own and do things in a way that works does not mean it was the way God wanted me to do it. Sometimes it's not my way. It's got to be Yahweh. Hopefully you all can move forward this next week and in any circumstances you face, take a step back. How you react to it is on your shoulders. Are you going to let God help you walk you through it in a path that might be less difficult than the one you want to take? Even if it appears scarier? Will pride and ego stand in your way? It's easy to hide behind your words. It's easy to hide behind intimidation tactics. But if you were face to face with your situation, would you act one way? Catch you all next week. Have a good rest of your night.